before you watch the main lectures for chapters 16 and 18, I wanted you to watch this piece first. What I'm going to do is just remind you of a conversation we had earlier in the semester uh, when we talked about public choice theory. We've been trying to integrate it into things that we've been doing all along, but it's worth, I think, an explicit reminder here as we turn to the two chapters on macroeconomic policy making. So the question we raised back in our discussion of public choice economics was something like this. Will policymakers do what the economic models say they should do? There is a difference between saying someone should do something and the question of whether, in fact, they will do it or whether they can do it. And as we pointed out in that discussion of public choice, once we begin to take public choice economics seriously, the question of government failure is on the table. Will policymakers do what we say they should do? When we assume behavioral symmetry, that is, when we assume that political actors are no more or less self-interested than people in the market are, when we think about politics as exchange, when we think about political actors as being vote seekers, like private entrepreneurs are profit seekers, when we ask who benefits, when we start to ask these questions and think this way about the political process, can we be sure that political actors will do what our models say that they should? And hopefully by now you should be skeptical that they will. And then the question becomes, as we pointed out in that earlier chapter, uh, a comparative one. Markets aren't perfect. Politics isn't perfect. Which one works better in this particular context? And how do we determine that? We suggested back then that one way to think about this question is to ask under what sets of institutions do people have the incentives and information that they need to do the right things and in particular to learn when they've made mistakes. And one of the things about markets we know is that prices and profits and losses provide both the incentive to change our behavior and the information that we need to change our behavior in pretty effective ways. Not perfect, but, but pretty effective. Are there the equivalents within politics? And how well do the signals of politics indicate to people that they've made a mistake and, and that they need to correct it and in what way to correct it? And the answer, I think, is that those signals are much, much weaker. So when we start to think about macroeconomic policy, in particular, when we start to think about whether we should have activist policy when economies don't do well, when we look like we're heading into recession or something like that, and we're thinking about monetary or fiscal policy and enacting them, we have to ask these questions. And when we ask them, right, we have to consider the possibility that what will happen when those policies are actually enacted, given the incentives facing real political actors, may well be worse than doing nothing. That the policy interventions may well make matters worse than whatever imperfections we're seeing in the marketplace. Can we know that for a fact ahead of time? Not necessarily. But that's the question we need to ask. And, and that's uh, a much better way of, of looking at these issues than simply saying, oh, markets don't work well. Bring on the policy. Here's the model. Here's what it says. That's what will happen. Because we know, in fact, that policy doesn't get made the way the models say it should. And the reasons for that are precisely why we study public choice economics. So I just wanted to remind you all of that set of issues that we raised way back many weeks ago. Uh, we've been trying to remind ourselves along the way that this, is, that this is all part of it, but here we are at the end sort of talking about policy. It's really important to bring this back explicitly and to build it into the very way that we think about policy, not as an additional thing, but again, the word we used back then was to endogenize, to build it right into the model and say we can't even model policy without taking account of these public choice considerations. That's the lesson, I think, to keep in mind as you read through chapters 16 and 18.